<laughs> come on, come on. Welcome, Pursuit. How many of y'all are excited to be here tonight? So, so good. Thank you all for, especially our, our tribe kids, we love that you're here. But especially if, you, if CFM is not your home, we just thank you so much to be, that you are here. It is such an honor, it's such a privilege. Let's just hear, if you are not a CFM person, let's just hear it from you right now. I just wanna hear you get some, make some noise. Okay, very cool, very cool. Um, really quick, I'm incredibly uh, ADD, and so help me out tonight. And let's, let's just cover this for the whole weekend. Sound good? Everybody shake your head, say yes, Josh, sounds good. This is what we're gonna do. I ask you this from the bottom of my, of my heart. During worship, like during this time right now, like once our butts are planted, let's keep them planted, sound good? Because guess what happens? Even me, I'm like, oh, where are they going? And then some of y'all are like, oh, she's cute. Oh, where is she going? And so you're not here for that anyway. We're here for Jesus. So let's make sure, let's stay where we are set. Sound good? All right. So really quick, Pastor Matt introduced me. Uh, I'm the junior high youth pastor here at Church on Fire. Uh, real quick, I think we have a picture of my beautiful family. Do we have that? Look at that. Oh my goodness. That is my beautiful wife, Allie. So, oh, come on, we didn't see them long enough. There we go. That's my beautiful wife, Allie. It's actually her birthday tomorrow. So if you see her, say happy birthday. She's holding uh, my incredible son, he, uh, just our wild man. His name is Levi. We call him Bugs. And then I'm holding my little sweet pea. Her name is Isabel, Izzy is what we call her. And it's just, a, it's such an adventure to have them as, a, as my family. And uh, I just want to just dive right in tonight. I think so far, we're just so excited that you are here. I'm just going to dive in. So. So many times I feel like there's these moments when it comes to these big God moments. Maybe it's summer camp, maybe it's a retreat, conference, whatever the heck you want to call it. There's these moments that we've set aside for God to speak. And I think so many times I, I watch it with students. Like the first time it's kind of like, oh, that was good. And the second time, oh, that was really good. And then the, like, you just keep diving in more and more. And I kind of want to address that idea tonight because I think the true reason behind that is because we've been so busy, we've been so distracted that once we get in the presence of the Lord, then all of a sudden we are starting to realign ourselves with Him. We are starting to line up our spirit with His and we are beginning to realign our ears to His voice. And so... As great as it is that you, know, it, you all eventually get excited, I don't want that to be a thing that takes a minute. I want us to dive right in tonight and go ahead and get ready to hear what the Lord has to say and for him to do what he's gonna do in our lives, amen? amen. All right, so let's pray. Jesus, oh God, you are so good. We love you so much, Lord. You are so awesome, God. Jesus, I thank you so much for each and every life that is represented in this room here tonight. God, I thank you that each and every life you have a specific plan for, a specific calling, a specific destiny, God. Lord, that nobody is here by accident. You have ordered them, their steps, and they're here to encounter your presence tonight, Father. And so Jesus, I pray, I thank you. I thank you so much, God, for the honor, for the privilege it is to be able to stand here and God to share your word. And Jesus, I pray that your word would go forth and God, it would bear much fruit in Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. Amen. So if you have your Bibles tonight, go ahead, grab your Bible, grab your notebooks. I wanna encourage you throughout the weekend, take notes because I can't tell you how valuable it is for me to stumble upon an old notebook and be like, oh my goodness, God spoke this to me? Or, or I read like what he was doing and it just encourages me so much. So grab your notebooks, get a pen, grab your Bible, open up with me to Mark chapter five. Mark chapter five. This is one of my favorite stories 
in the New Testament because this is something that there's so much, so many biblical pr principles to this story and I could just go on with it and on with it and let's just go ahead and dive in. I'm reading the message version tonight. We're gonna be starting in verse 25. And so a woman who had suffered a, con a condition of hemorrhaging for 12 years. Hemorrhaging, what that means is there is a bleeding that cannot stop. And so she's been bleeding constantly without ceasing for 12 years. A long succession of physicians had treated her and treated her badly, taking all of her money and leaving her worse off than before. Had, she had heard about Jesus. She slipped in from behind and touched his robe. She was thinking to herself, if I can put a finger on his robe, I can get well. The moment she did it, the, the flow of blood dried up. She could feel the change and knew her plague was over and done with. At that same moment, Jesus felt energy discharging from him. He turned around to the crowd and asked, who touched my robe? His disciples said, what are you talking about? With this crowd pushing and jostling, you're asking who touched me? Dozens have touched you. But he went on asking, looking around to see who had done it. The woman knowing what had happened, knowing she was the one, stepped up in fear and trembling, knelt before him and gave him the whole story. And Jesus said to her, daughter, you took a risk of faith and now you're healed and whole. Live well, live blessed, be healed of your plague. And so we read this story, and if we look at it just kind of through our eyes, it seems like it's kind of a bad deal. Bleeding for 12 years. I'm sure she, at times she felt really weak, she felt sick, and oh my goodness, I just can't imagine. That alone is bad enough. But this is the thing, when we start to look at this story, through the cultural context in that time, all of a sudden it goes from kind of an unfortunate story to an absolutely devastating and heartbreaking story. Because let me walk you through kind of, it's bad enough that she bled for 12 years, but there was a lot of other side effects in her life, not just physical, that was affected by this. And here's one of them. Because of that, she can never have a child. She can never get pregnant. So what that meant for her is she was never able to encounter the joy of holding her first son or daughter. She was never able to be able to get bestowed upon her the honor of being a mother. And that alone is very heartbreaking but it gets even worse because, because of that one thing, all of a sudden, she's not even a candidate for anybody to marry her, anyone. Like he could be the ugliest dude in town, she could be the best looking lady around and then he's still not attracted to her because she can't have a child and that means he can never pass along his name. So she, can't have a child, she'll never be married, and guess what, if this would have happened when she had already been married, that means that that man now is legally allowed to divorce her and get rid of her. Pretty bad deal, right? But it gets worse. Because this is also kind of a side effect of that. Is that now she is marked as a disgrace to her own family. And because she was a disgrace to her own family, what that meant is that they would disown her and even abandon her. The very people that should have loved her the most now throw this name of disgrace on her, disown her, and abandon her. And that's bad enough, right? But it gets worse. You see, 
at that time in culture, family is huge. It's massive. Like you, that is probably one of the most important elements of their lives. And this story is told three different times in the Bible, but never once is this woman's family mentioned, meaning more than likely she was now labeled disgrace and they had abandoned her. It also talks about that she visited doctor after doctor after doctor after doctor and each and every one of them took advantage of her. Do you think that would have taken place if she would have had family around her? So she kept reaching out for help to all of these people because she didn't have any help from her family. But yet again, it gets worse. Because because of this issue, she is now marked as not just as disgrace, but now she's marked as unclean. And because of this, she's not even permitted to go in public. And so now, imagine this. Y'all, y'all know when like summer break happens and you, at school you have those friends that like, you know their name, like you know a little bit about them, and you're kind of friends, but like you don't really miss them. And so summer break comes up and you're like, oh, who were they again? And then you go back to school and then all of a sudden, oh wait, I know you, I remember you. We were kind of friends, kind of not. Well, get this. So this went on for 12 years. So if she still had friends after she was marked as a disgrace, she's not allowed to go in public and see them. So how long do you think it took, just like our summer break friends, that she was forgotten about? And so now, go with me here. She's now a disgrace. She's now abandoned. She's unworthy of love. She's unclean. And now she's forgotten. And if we're honest with ourselves tonight, we can probably relate with one of those things. Where there's times that we felt like a disgrace where we have personally felt like we were abandoned, that we were unworthy of any love, that we were unclean, or that we were forgotten about. And so that is why I wanted to go into this story tonight. You see, because that is exactly what the devil, what the enemy does is he takes our issues to bring shame and then he uses our circumstances to bring isolation. And so now we're in a place, we're dealing with these issues, but we feel so alone and there's nobody around to help. But what I love is the way that Jesus responds to her. And so this is where where we're gonna go is, you see, we can relate. As this woman was probably at one time, she wasn't those five things. She wasn't a disgrace. She wasn't abandoned. She wasn't unworthy of love. She wasn't unclean. She wasn't forgotten about. But at one time, she was probably daughter. She was probably granddaughter. Future mother, future wife, beloved friend. And one issue came in and took away every bit of that identity and threw on this new identity. And so some of y'all here tonight are sitting here being like, I relate, I feel like I've been forgotten about, I feel unworthy of love, I feel like I'm a disgrace. But this is what I felt so strongly, this is what God would look at you in the eyes and this is what he would say. (laughs) 
Your identity is not your issues, and you are not your circumstances. What God would look at you in the eyes tonight and say is, hello, wake up. You are not your issues, and you are not, your identity is not your issues, and you are not your circumstances. And we can see that in exactly how he responds to her. Because she reaches out, she touches his robe, and this is what he says when he finds out that it was her. And Jesus said to her, daughter, you took a risk of faith. Now you're healed and whole. Live well, live blessed, be healed of your plague. You see, society saw the things that she was while Jesus looked at her and he saw who she was. People looked at her and saw all the things that she was. They saw the disgrace to her family. They saw that she was abandoned. They saw that she was unworthy. They saw that she was unclean. They saw that she was forgotten about. But Jesus looked at her. And I can just picture this, him going around the crowd, trying to figure out, and then all of a sudden they lock eyes. And he looks at her and he says, you know what? Daughter, be healed. Live, Live well. Live blessed. You see, Because just as Jesus said that, when Jesus looks at you, he never sees mistake. He never sees accident. He never sees unworthy. He never sees unclean. But when when Jesus looks at us in the eyes, what he says is, you are my child. You were made in my image. You are loved. You are called. You are chosen. And I love you. And if that is what he sees, then we can get rid of all the other trash that we've taken on ourselves. So check this out with me. I have a couple pictures that are going to come up. Go ahead and throw up the first one. Look at this guy. What do you think that this guy's identity is? Shout it out. Soldier. Warrior. Okay. Okay. This guy's probably a pretty patriotic guy. He's pretty tough. He's okay with sacrificing. Let's bring up the other one. What we got here? Shout it out. NFL player, football player. Okay. So a champion, there we go. And so uh, think about this. When you see this guy, you probably think he has to work on what he eats. He has to wake up early, he has to work out, he has to train, he has to condition. He has to sacrifice so that he can be who he is. Let's bring up the the last one. What's this guy? Shout it out. Carpenter, construction worker. Engineer. So we think, we look at this guy and we probably think, you know what, this guy, uh, he's probably a pretty strong dude. He probably has calloused hands because he's working all day. He probably drives like a truck with like a ladder rack on it and something like that. He probably wears, he probably wears Carhartt much beyond just this hipster statement that we wear in our beanies. And so, but this is where I want, where I want to go for a second. The identity that we take determines the life that we live. The identity that we take determines the life that we live. And so we see this woman, and we can see that she wasn't taking on the identity of who she was in Christ, because we can see the life that she lived. We can see that the identity that she took on herself was just that of disgrace, abandoned, 
unworthy, unclean, and forgotten. Because look at the very life that she lived. You see, the identity that we take on upon us determines the exact life that we live. And you see, so often we don't understand that we have a say in the matter. What I hear from students, and I've heard it so frequently, why did God let this happen? Where was he when this took place? Does he even see me? Does he even know I exist? Does he even care that I'm hurting right now? Does he even care that I'm dealing with depression, that I've been cutting myself, that I want to die? Does he even care? Because if that is the identity that we are taking on, what do you think the life looks like that we live? And so rather than asking those questions, maybe what we should be doing is looking at the identity that we have taken on that does not reflect the identity that Christ has given us. How do we fix the identity issue? How do we get rid of all these false identities that we've taken on, that it has affected our day-to-day -day lives, and bring back the identity that God has called us to be. You see, so many times we're just like that woman, where we look at the very thing that can fix the identity issue, but we don't reach out for him. You see, this is what other versions of the Bible says. It says that they recognized that, they, that she knew who Jesus was and that she recognized his power. If I can have the band go ahead and start coming on up. She knew who Jesus was and she recognized his power. How did she know who Jesus was? How did she understand the power that he held? This is what it speaks to me. There's a good chance that that same street that she had to force her way through the crowd and push her way just to reach out and touch Jesus' robe, there's a very good chance that before she had seen Jesus walk down that very road and healed blind eyes, get rid of disease, cast out demons, work in powerful and wonderful ways, but she never walked out and reached out for him, the very one that could fix her issue. But at some point, there was this moment of breaking where she said, you know, I realize I'm not getting any help from my family. I realize now that every single one of these doctors I've visited are doing nothing but take advantage of me. And I just need help. And so she's sitting there in her home and all of a sudden she hears all this ruckus outside. She said, what is going on? And she looks out the window and she sees Jesus and recognizes his power. And out of sheer desperation, she says, wait, this is the man 
that I've seen heal eyes. This is the man that I've seen work miracles. I have to get there. And out of sheer desperation, I just imagine this, that she throws open her door and runs out and says, I am not okay with being forgotten anymore. I'm not okay with being a disgrace to my family any longer. I'm tired of feeling like I'm unworthy of any love. I'm sick of being unclean. I don't want to feel like I'm abandoned anymore. But because of that, I'm going to push my way through this crowd. And I'm going to work and I'm going to reach out for the only one who can fix it. And his name is Jesus. So this is where I want to go tonight. I've heard too many stories these past few months of y'all just dealing with those issues that are causing your identity to shift from who who God calls you to be to what these things are placing on you. And what I really just truly believe that the Lord wants to do tonight is he just wants to speak his truth. If we can, just pull up that picture of Levi. Just leave it up for a minute. This is Levi. He just, he just turned three. We call, him, we call him bugs. One of my favorite things about being a dad Sometimes is bedtime. <laughs> but what I love is, is, is y'all will see him around a little bit this weekend. He's just, he's just wild. He's, he's going constantly. And when he's just exhausted, it's like he just tries to get the rest out all in one jolt until he's finally just. <sighs> and so we lay down with him in his bed and he'll be moving or he'll say, uh, read whatever book that he wants to read that night. But eventually what happens is he slows down and he like scoots into me and he takes his hand and grabs mine and wraps it around him. And he says, daddy, hold you. And in those moments, it's just the most precious time because what I get to do is I just get to begin to pray over him. And I get to start saying, Bugs, Daddy loves you. Bugs, Mama loves you. Hey, Levi, Jesus loves you. And there's nothing that you will ever do that will change that. Levi, Jesus have, has huge plans for your life. You're gonna do great things for his glory. And what I wanna do tonight is let's begin the process right now of realigning our spirit with the fathers and tuning in our ears to who he says we are. And so what we're going to do, the band's just going to play. We're not just going to, we're not going to sing for a minute. And here's what I want you to do. I want you to take your notebooks, your pens. And what I want you to do is I just want you just to prepare yourself for the identity that Jesus is about to speak over you. See, because I was praying this morning and when I heard him speak to me as clear as day, he says, my children are no longer going to feel abandoned. My children are worthy of my love and my children will not be forgotten. 
So the way we're gonna wrap up this tonight is I, want, I just want you to make room. If you need to go, sit on the floor. If you wanna come down front, whatever that looks like for you, I just want you to get to yourself and get to the place where just like Levi, where he says, Daddy holds you. And then get ready to hear what your father is about to speak over you. So go ahead, don't don't wait, stand up now. Find a spot that's good for you. Sit on the floor, find an empty chair, sit against the wall, whatever works for you. And the band is just gonna play. And what I believe, what I know is that Jesus is going to begin to open up our ears to hear his heavenly voice. And just go ahead and get out that notebook now, believing in faith that he's going to say something. And when he begins to speak, write down every word that he says. Father God, right now, through the power of your Holy Spirit, I ask that you would open up deaf ears. Father God, ears that have been closed off due to the false identities that have been placed on them. And Jesus, I pray that you would free them to listen, to hear the true identity of who they are in you. Jesus, I thank you that you are faithful. I thank you that you love your children, that you delight in them. Jesus, I thank you that in these next few moments, that just as your word says, that we will recognize the voice of the Father. So God, right now, we ask that you would come and you would speak to your children.